episode 30, Hobby Group Therapy Session with Rob Gerard, the sports card therapist. All right, I think we're live. Welcome to the 30th episode of The Card Diary by Javi S. Thompson. Oh, I think I might have started too early. Welcome to the 30th episode of The Card Diary by Javi S. Thompson. I am your host, Denny Cards, self-proclaimed master of none and jack of all trades. And thank you for tuning in because as I like to paraphrase Jay-Z, you could be listening to any podcast in the world right now, but you're here with me. But you're not here just with me. You're here with Rob Gerard, the sports card therapist. There he is. He gave a wave. Um, we're going to get to him in a moment here, but congratulations uh, to, I guess, this podcast. We finally hit the 1,000 plays milestone across all episodes. Rob helped get us there. He did just like uh, leapfrogged. It was uh, probably the most um, listened to and also most um, you know appreciated podcast, the one we did uh, in episode 29. So I thank each and every one of you for downloading and listening. And of course, I very much thank... Um, the first, I guess, repeat guest, because we just left so much on the table from our first conversation and people really liked it. Um, you know, we, I, I think you, would you agree, Rob? Like, I, I hope you had a good time the first time. <laughs> yeah, man. And uh, thank you for having me back. It's uh first time was, was definitely fun. You know, it, uh, we got into some, some pretty deep stuff, you know, and uh, you know, it was welcomed for sure. So uh you know, you do a great job. So keep it up, man. And congrats oh, on hitting 30. Thank you so much. Yeah. 30 is the new 20. I don't know. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, no, I, I, you know, I think what really people really liked was we were having some really good discussions about things that are happening in the hobby. You know, we're, we're talking a little bit about cards, but mostly about psychology and just everything around cards, right? I mean, we, we come for the cards, but we stay for the people and, you know, the stories, the relationships. Someone recently asked me, well, you know, what do you collect? Or, you know, and I said experiences. Um, who do you collect? People, you know, people's stories. I think that's, I mean, it's easy for me to say, oh, I PC this person or that person. But, you know, it's, we all have our collections, right? And if people see my feed, they can they can see the cards that I collect. So um, how do you, well, like, does that resonate with you? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think in this hobby, um, it just, it is all about the cards. I mean, if it wasn't for the cards, I wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for the right. cards, then this would be nothing different than a social club, right? And there's plenty right. of social clubs out there I can join. But, uh, <laughs> for me, the foundation of everything that I do is definitely about the cardboard. It's definitely right. about the cards. And then I think, uh, and I just said this, I was a guest on another podcast and it probably came to me because they actually used it as a clip, but mm -hmm. I had said that the best part of the national was the cards, but one B to that, like a, a mm -hmm. very close, very close second was the people. And uh, right. so, yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt, uh, I don't know if I, I know for a fact, I would not be as immersed in the hobby if it was not for the people. I know I would be here though, because the cards are what the cards are the foundation of everything. Right. But I, I think the last episode, you and I both talked about how when we were in this hobby, uh, younger, uh, you know, earlier when we were, you know, we were adults. Um, I think some people, they went straight from teenage years to, you know, like their late thirties or forties. Um, but for us, like we were there in the 2007 to 2012 range, at least for me. And, you know, I think you and I both lamented how we, we couldn't find our communities. We couldn't find people because, you know, Instagram didn't exist. Social media was in its, in its infancy. So, um, yeah, the people really is, I mean, it's one A and one B is a great way to put it. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, what's really interesting, though, is when you think about other hobbies, I mean, you know, <laughs> I like to sometimes pick on crocheting because I, I just couldn't see myself crocheting. Um, but <laughs> there is no, like, gambling or breaking aspect right to other hobbies like if you're if you love bike riding you just go ride a bike um but there isn't this like aspect of of what's in this pack of things you like to collect yeah i don't know i'm thinking right as you're saying that i'm thinking well if people love fishing and they go out on a fish charter or a shark charter 
and they're not guaranteed to catch a shark, but that's their goal. Mm. If they don't come back from that, is 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 that kind of like gambling? I don't know. It's kind of you know. I'm sure. I'm sure there's definitely levels to it when it comes to you know the card hobby though. Um, they have really figured out a way to really come super close to gambling. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, they've, they've come incredibly close to the lottery, you know, like the state yeah. lottery, like they've, they pretty much like emulated. It feels like that. And I could remember the first time I ever learned about exactly what breaking was. And mm-hmm. I was like, I was just kind of baffled by it. I was like, what? So you're telling me that, it's thirty dollars a spot, and there's no guarantee of a card. Mm-hmm. You know, so to me, like, I just couldn't wrap my head around it. I'm not a gambler, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I know I'm not a gambler, um, and I've just always liked a sure thing. I mean, we talked last episode how, you know, I've always just kind of bought singles. You know, I I did right. not rip a ton of wax as a kid. It was just always singles. I'm always kind of going for a sure thing. I guess even if even if I'm selling myself a little sure short, I do like a sure thing. No, absolutely. You know, it's really interesting because there is certainly a randomness when it comes to something like fishing, which I'm not very good at. It's not my hobby, but um I think it's like the randomness plus the money put in, right? I mean, when you say $30 spot, I mean, you'd be lucky nowadays, right? With the cost of hobby boxes or, you know, again, when you and I were grown up, like we're, we're, we're pack hunting, we're, you'd be lucky to buy a box. Nowadays, it's like people are buying cases, right? It's like, you're looking for the case. The box set isn't even good enough anymore. Yeah. And I just can't wrap my head around it. I really can't because just, when it comes to, and by all means, I'm not trying to put down opening up boxes or ripping wax or anything oh, yeah, like yeah. that. That's a huge mm-hmm. part of the hobby and a huge mm-hmm. part of the enjoyment of the hobby for many. Yeah. But for me, when it comes to buying a case of cards, right? Say a case is, I don't know, I don't know. I'm going to make up some numbers. I'm probably going to be way off here. But say a case oh. is 3K. Yeah. Right? A case is 3K. And, you know, the case hit. I mean, what what would a case hit be worth? And it obviously depends on the card, depends on this, right. depends on that. But right. but the chances of you pulling that top 1% from that mm-hmm. set, that top 1% is, I mean, it's got to be like 1 in 10,000, right? I mean, it's just, it's astronomical sometimes, the odds. Mm-hmm. And to me, I would rather take that 3K and just buy the sure thing. I could probably go out and buy that exact case hit that I'm chasing. But oh yeah, I mean, yeah. I realize though that by doing that, you're taking a lot of the excitement out of it. You're taking mm-hmm. a whole experience away from someone. So I do get that. But what I would say is there's also a great great experience that comes with the hunt of mm-hmm. hunting down a single card. So, you know, I think it kind of it depends what you like, what your wheelhouse is, I guess, but I know for me, I would much prefer a sure thing. I hate losing money. Um, I lose enough money on buying <laughs> and selling cards in itself. I don't yeah. want to lose even more by buying cases and buying in the breaks. Shout out to the breakers, though. <laughs> hey, what, we have a delicate ecosystem. Uh, I think yeah. um, like a New Year's uh, resolutions post I said was, you know, I'm going to try to, again, this is the premise of the podcast is trying to empathize and try to see how other people live to try to get an understanding of them and to really appreciate them. So, you know, I do plan on having a chapter on breaking after I think my next chapter is going to be about grading. Um, But when it comes down to this ecosystem we have, it's like, we're all needed. I mean, sometimes people say, might say, Oh, I don't like this particular animal in the ecosystem and it's invasive or it's bad, but you need that particular species so that, you know, so that there's this whole, you know, food cycle within the ecosystem. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, shout out to the good breakers. Uh, you know, what I've said in the past, I'll say now is good breakers are good for the hobby. Bad breakers are bad for the hobby. Yeah. Yeah. So well said. yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, praise from my sports car therapist. Thank you so much. So what I would like to do today is, um, get into some group questions. I almost make this into like a group therapy session, but before I do, I did want to mention something, um, for people who are watching on video, um, which, you know, this is intended for our, optimization of audio. Um, I'm not wearing glasses today. Uh, I do, um, when I work out or when I play basketball, I don't like to wear glasses. I like to like put contacts on. So I can see, 
Um, you know, and my glasses are not novelty glasses. They're actually very strong, thick prescriptions. Um, but uh, I wanted to kind of get your help. Uh, you know, before we get into group therapy, I wanted to do a little individual therapy because I, I feel like I didn't get to do that last time. And, you know, I really wanted to try that with you if that's okay. Yeah, some, I guess, uh, off the record, you know, uh, play therapy. Play as long hobby. As Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm, no, not, I'm definitely not. I'm definitely not going to, uh, on the air, say that I'm going to give anyone any kind of psychotherapy. That's for sure. But, but it, yes, we can. Exactly. We can do some play psychotherapy for sure. Thank you very much. Thank you for indulging. Yep. Um. So, you know, someone again. It's it's. We're. we're I'm kind of like joking around with it. I'm dancing around with it. But you know, you are actually a licensed uh, psychotherapist, and mm -hmm. you is, is that right? Psychotherapist. I'm yep. sorry if I get it wrong. Okay. Yep. So, um, and I'm sorry we didn't do an intro, but I feel like people listen to the last episode, episode 29, this is episode 30. So hopefully they, you know, get an understanding of you yep. and who you are. But the last time we recorded was last Saturday. Um, and I guess I could put a date on it. Today's August 10th, which is a Thursday. And last Saturday was August 5th. And so Sunday, August 6th, I posted something on Instagram. Um and a comment came through and you know i won't read it verbatim but basically the gist was you know uh do you even collect cards again kind of go into this whole like what you know who do you pc what do you pc uh, i feel like that's been a, a recent um i don't know like criticism of me and then the person was like well you're it seems like you're just plastering your uh, a billboard across your forehead uh they called me fat and so now i'm like not that I'm like, I need to uh, give oxygen to this person, but I'm like, you know what? Like, I didn't like the way I looked in national. So I'm just going to like try to work out some more. I, it was already in my plans to try to get in shape after national because I was like, that's my goal where I'm going to just start hitting the ground running. So it's not like I'm saying this one person motivated me to, to but so I'm not wearing my glasses. I have my contacts on. Um, but yeah, I kind of wanted to get your advice and guidance uh, about how to deal with that type of negativity and those comments in in our space uh yeah man well first of all i want to say um any kind of online bullying or shaming or name calling um i'm not here for that i don't think anyone is especially in this hobby where most of us are adults you know there's definitely a younger population in the hobby um, when, when it comes to putting out content, I've said it many times on my podcast, when I choose to put out content and that content can be in the form of podcast, it could be on YouTube or it could be content just on social media. It could be content on my Instagram profile. When you choose to do that, you become public property. You become really, you're putting yourself out there for the scrutiny of what people have to say and what people think. And I, I think it's terrible if people are, it sounds like they definitely are, um, you know, saying some negative things to you online. Um, you know, I, I'm, I would never try to victim blame by any means. Uh, I, I would say that your approach could, you know, probably your responses to i think some of it probably might warrant other people being like oh you know what i'm gonna go at him too because i've <laughs> seen that if someone has criticized you you've basically screenshot it and and put them on blast yeah. so people i mean i wouldn't take that approach mm -hmm. personally but but we're two different people you know right. i've gotten my fair share of criticisms for sure um you know i will typically block them which then mm -hmm. ends up deleting the comment because now they're blocked from whatever right. thread it is or whatever. And then I keep it moving. My blocked list is very long <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, it's still growing. And, <laughs> and personally, I don't want to give any kind of shine or any kind of light to any of that stuff, not yeah. to stay like you want to sweep it under the rug. Um, but you know, I, I know in a DM, uh, you and I had spoke and it was it was something similar to that and if you'll just give me a moment i'm gonna pull up the dm real quick because um i thought about what i wanted to say to you and i felt okay. like what was that 
No, sure. Absolutely. Um, did you yeah, want me to no. kind of like talk for time or you have it? No, 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 no. Yeah, I got it right here. Okay. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm seeing you had posted the guy's profile and exactly what he said. So everyone can see who it is that said something negative to you. Mm. I said, um, I said, it's unfortunate that you're getting negative comments like this. I'm sorry to hear it. What I will say is that I have gotten a large share of negativity as well. It comes with the territory. Just block them and move on. Don't let it rent space in your head. I often think of the quote with Denzel Washington from American Gangster, where uh, the mobster said to him, he said, Frank, success took a shot at you. He said, you can be successful and have enemies, or you could be unsuccessful and you could have friends. And And I like, so that always kind of resonates with me. Right. And, and I followed that up with my comment to you. I said, people also get very protective over the hobby. People get very protective over the hobby. Mm -hmm. And my exact quote was people get very protective over pump and dumpers and clout chasers in this hobby. And since you're new to putting out content, I don't think you've built up enough trust in this hobby to post certain things without getting that hate. And I followed that up with, and, and I want to say, I don't think you're a clout chaser. I don't think you're a pump and dumper by any means. But if no one knew who you were a year ago, and now you're just flooding people's timelines with very brash content, um, you you have a very good chance of getting put in certain categories. I could think of certain certain like content creators who like a year ago, I didn't know who they were. And now it's like, they're everywhere and they don't have much credibility in people's eyes. You know what I mean? Because they haven't been around enough to kind of build up that trust. And I know like me with when I came back into the hobby three years ago and started the podcast, I looking back on it, I didn't realize I was doing it, but looking back on it, I did kind of dip my toe in and I was, you know, slowly, you know, putting out episodes and slowly I started bringing on some guests and, and by episode 30, 40, I I think I really had started to build up some credibility. And I think the reason why people might, and I, I have no idea what your page looks like. I haven't looked at your Instagram page to be honest, but if, if there's, if the content is outweighing card posts, people might look at that a certain way. And I think that's why you might be getting comments like, well, what do you collect? Do you mm-hmm. even collect? Because people get protective over, you know, what they call plants. You know, they feel like someone's like planted in the hobby to be mm. whatever, you know, and that's definitely not always the case. Um, you know, I'm good friends with Stephanie mama breaks and, uh, you know, I've had her on my show many times, you know, hung out with her in person and, and all that stuff. And, and there are people that criticize her as be, of being a plant, like, like a company planted her there or companies planted her there. Yeah. They're propping her up. And, and I'm like, that's ridiculous. That's mm-hmm. ridiculous. I know for a fact, Stephanie is not. However, I could understand why people might look at certain people a certain way, because when someone starts flooding your timeline, when six months ago, you had no idea who they were, you know, it feels kind of, you know, and that's probably a credit to you because if you know, what's worse than getting negative comments, nothing, right? (laughs) No comments, right? That's what's worse. And I'll tell you what, uh, a good friend told me that, and that was Chris, Chris Hoge from Card Ladder. He told mm, me that a couple of years ago. He said, he said, listen, man, don't worry. Soak in those negative comments because there's, <laughs> he said, there's so many people out there that are trying to do what you do, and they're not even moving the needle. Right. He said, you're moving the needle. And he was right. I had no idea my show mm. would grow into what it is today. But at the time, it was like, uh, you know, I had to learn to kind of grow thick skin, I guess. And I'm not... I'm not justifying any of the negativity. So I hope it's not mm-hmm. coming across like that. No. I'm just saying that I can understand why some people, and I'm sure there's some people that still look at me like that, even though I have my, I still have my cards from the eighties and the nineties and the two thousands, just because I wasn't at the forefront or, you know, on people's timelines all the mm-hmm. time ten years ago, doesn't mean I can't be today. Exactly. Um, I may be new to Instagram or like, you know, almost uh, a year in, but I've been collecting, you know, as a little kid, as a young adult and coming back now. But yeah, my credentials or my bona fides, I actually say this all the time is 
I'm wholly unqualified to have this podcast. And I think that's what makes it fun. I think some people love having a different perspective. Um, I am coming at it with like, you know, a, a, a kid's eyes or a, a, a novice's eyes because that's that's who I am. So, yeah, I'm not an industry insider. So um, but I do appreciate it. I mean, yeah, you and I have very different um we're very we're similar in, in many respects and then dissimilar in others, but that's what makes us human. That's what makes us special and different, right? So I, I definitely respect you. Do you have any pushback some... back on what I said? Is there anything that you're like, you know what, Rob? No, nah, hmm. you're you're it feels like you're like letting bully slide or anything. No, like no, that. no, no. Um, I the, the only and it's not a pushback, but it's more of a, a comment to what you said, which is I've heard other people say that to me, and you know, people are like, hey, don't let it get to you and don't give oxygen to the trolls and all that. But for me, it's like I get what you're saying with putting your face out on the internet. Shouldn't I expect that people are going to come after me? Like, that's a really good point. I've had other people say that to me too, but it's almost like, yes, it theoretically, like I understand it in theory, but when it actually happens, it, it still like stings. Right. And it's almost like people like, don't let it get to you. Don't let it, you know, don't care about it. But it's almost like, I'm also the type of person who appreciates when people say, you know, nice things or praise because that, that matters to me too. So it's not like I can only have the good stuff matter and then the bad stuff not matter. I think that I'm human. And so the whole point of my, this podcast is to humanize all aspects of, of people in the hobby. So I guess what I'm trying to say is like, for instance, like we know that there are two certain seasons, <laughs> the, the classic saying there are uh, two certain seasons, two certainties in life, de death and taxes. But you know, when you have a death in the family, and you know, like, let's say it's from a prolonged battle with a, with an illness. It it doesn't mean that it, you know, it, it you mourn any less because it, when it actually happens, because you still like it sucks when it happens. Right. So I guess what I'm trying to say is like, I read it and it's like, I mean, we're several days past it. And I kind of want to make this be part of my like, you know, therapy session to talk about it with you. But it stings a whole lot less than it did four days ago you know and it's going to sting a lot less as i continue to go along but you know i just wanted to definitely talk about it because that is the mental health and the hobby uh mental health and social media and you know you're you're the guest who's <laughs> who's really good at that stuff yeah and and let me tell you man um you know i've had people make 30 minute youtube videos just about me trying to tear me down and listen to every single episode and try to find any kind of discrepancies I've said. Um, so, you know, I mean, let me tell you something in my experience. So I've had, I've had like watchdogs, like all over me, right. For mm -hmm. what reason? I have no idea. I, I really don't, you know, I hear what they're saying, but there's nothing there for whatever it is they're saying. I'm a phony. I'm this, I'm that. Um, when I, I've blocked watchdogs before they mm -hmm. lose it. The, the one, the thing that they hate the most, I can't say for all everyone, but they want something to hate. They, they, let me tell you something. When people start criticizing you and leave you negative comments, chances are they're your biggest fans. You know, there's such a thin line between a hater and a fan. It's unbelievable. So, you know, when I look at all my streams that I've acquired from over the years of on my podcast, I do sit back and think sometimes, I wonder how many of these streams are from people that absolutely hate me, but they can't stop listening. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like there are certain watchdogs out there that if Jeff Wilson disappeared, those watchdogs would disappear too. Hmm. Th those people that are constantly criticizing because the second Jeff Wilson drops an episode, the second he drops anything, guess what? These watchdogs have a new episode up of their own an hour later. Wow. You know what I mean? So, so I mean, I, I don't see anything. I don't see any, any, in any part of it that would be helpful to do what you did, which is like screenshot and then try to shame that person. Right. Because yeah. I get the whole like public shaming. Maybe you wanted to try to have them canceled from the hobby. I don't know. Mm. I, mean, I don't even care. All oh, I know is if I would have just blocked the guy, yeah, I probably would have been upset about it for two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, maybe 20 minutes. I would have mm -hmm. forgot about it by dinner. Yeah. 
But the mm-hmm. fact if I would have posted it and now people are commenting on it and now for the next three days, I'm going back and responding to comments. Now it's in my head. Now it's not just surface level. Now it's probably penetrated me to an extent and yeah. it gave that guy more clout as well. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And, and one thing that, you know, I feel like I've said it a million times over the course of my life, you know, working with people and even looking at like myself and family members, um, the phrase hurt people, hurt people, mm. you know, so when when people are hurt or when people have been hurt, they look to hurt others. So when someone tries to come at me, I really do just look at them with I don't want to say pity, but I do look at them and, and I almost like I immediately forgive them. I'm like, listen. They are so off base with what they're saying. It doesn't even make sense to me. Even if it did, if someone called me bald because I'm bald, like, what am I going to screenshot it and and try to shame the guy to the hobby? People, would, I would lose so much credibility if I started doing that. Mm. People would look at me as a joke. Gotcha. Well, and I I'm hope people... people. I'm not saying people look at you as a joke. I'm not trying to say that. But yeah. I know me with what I've built up. I right. would instantly lose credibility in the hobby amongst listeners and and content consumers if i started trying to shame people that were coming at me even if i yeah. felt like it was justified so so it's interesting i i think my end goal wasn't to shame the person although their name was there i i have blocked that person since then but i think what i wanted to do was document my journey to show people like I mean, that, that was just like one person. I've gotten some strange DMs and audio messages from, I don't even know if you call them followers or people who are supportive. It's like, this, like you said, like a borderline. Um, I don't know if they like me or don't like me, but they, they're passionate. And I think we do want passion in the hobby. And I know there are people who are trying to be the gatekeepers or watchdogs and all that stuff. But for me, it's just like I you know, I felt it and then I wanted to release it. And then, um, maybe I did want some, you know, uh, not nothing again. I I didn't want people to attack that guy. I think I, what I wanted was to put that out there to show that this things, this sucks, you know, we shouldn't have these type of comments, but also like the amount of outpouring, like when I actually started getting like teary, um, later that day, it was not from the guy who posted that, but it was from the, the people telling me to, you know, persevere and to continue on and the support, the love and support yeah. is what really got me choked up. I mean, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I do, I'm a, I'm a em- empath or, you know, I, I try to see good in people. And even that person, when he made that comment about me, you know, and my weight, it was after me trying to show him some empathy. Um, so I, I get it. We're different people. Uh, I think people don't, expect that from you because you've built you know, like your brand is like above board and it's clean and it's it's good but i think for me i'm still like raw i'm still learning right i'm still like still trying to figure out like what i'm doing all of this for or like just i like to think i'm having fun but there are definitely sometimes when things are not fun like that type of you know comment or that post but i think this is a great discussion to have because i don't know i just don't hear a lot of people talking about this stuff Definite, definite great discussion. Um, I've, like I said, my, my block list is so long and it's not because I've, I don't think I've ever blocked anyone that didn't randomly come at me or try to get slick with me and people still do, you know what I mean? It's Mm -hmm. like the more people I reach, the more people, the more ears or eyes that get laid on me, uh, I'm going to continue to, you know, get that kind of stuff. And for me, like you said, like, that's not my brand, quote unquote, my brand. Like, I don't even know what my brand is. You know, I don't have, I don't have an agent. I'm not a brand <laughs> designer. I'm not a marketer yeah. by trade. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, so I'm, I'm really just being me and this is yeah. who I am. And my wife has always said to me, she's like, the biggest knock on you is you just forgive people instantly. You give wow. everyone the benefit of the doubt. Someone could hit me with a car and I would I would get up and be like, you know what? They probably, you know, just something would just give them the benefit of the doubt. My wife yeah. is like, you let people walk all over you. And I'm like, oh. people definitely do not walk all, all over me. I have, I have great boundaries. I can be mm-hmm. firm, assertive when I need to be. 
But yeah, I'm going to give everyone the benefit of the doubt. And chances are, you know, the people that are saying that to you, um, I would imagine they might be looking at you being and, and thinking like, how is this guy at national and how is he posting these videos and, <laughs> and doing all this? I didn't even know who he was six months ago. I've been in this right. hobby five years and, mm. and no one gives a crap about me, but Denny is everywhere. Like for all right. you know, that's what they're thinking. So, you know, yeah, well, I definitely uh, might have snuck in. I have to check the statute of limitations in the state of Illinois for that one. But um, <laughs> so I, I got to say um, the brand, the best way the, the word brand is icky, you know, influencer. It's icky. I don't think I'm an influencer. I think I'm a content creator. I love being a content creator. But when it comes to influence, I'm not trying to peddle anything or sell anything. I'm I'm a, I would like to think maybe I inspire people like I would love to people. People have come to me saying you know, watching your content makes me want to do other things in the hobby. Uh, and, and I love that. I really do. But I, the best way I've heard brand explained to me is, you know, what are people saying about you when you're not in the room? That's your brand. And I really thought about that. And I was like, wow, that's a really good way of putting it. Right. It's like when you are not present and people will talk. Um, and if you don't have a brand, then people won't talk. But if you do have a brand, uh, what are they saying about you? Um, I don't know what people are saying about me, but I know that what I try to do is, and it's not even trying, I don't go out of my way to do it, but I, I want to show people like behind the scenes, behind the curtains, um, how, you know, when I do things, how I do things, why I do things. Um, and also my brand is, yeah, I very much say all the time, like I'm Asian American, I'm Korean American. And um, I've definitely grappled with my Asian American identity in and out of the hobby. But I like to share that stuff because maybe someone's listening who is Asian American or Korean American being like, oh, my gosh, like I do, too. And I'm not the only one. So, um, yeah, I'll stop. There. No, no, I think that's awesome. man. I think um, really. I don't know many people i don't think i've come across many people in life who are 100 percent comfortable and 100 percent love themselves and if if they do that's amazing that's awesome you know maybe you could give me some tips on how to do it um you know because there's definitely things that i've struggled with as well and i love that you discuss your race and ethnicity and that you highlight that you know and you because i think we all need to celebrate our differences right and and really celebrate what makes us unique you know i mm -hmm. never i never want to just say oh well we're all people i treat everyone the same you know it's like um so you know when it's come to um cultural competency in the workplace you know that's something that i i've i've developed curriculums and give presentations on cultural competency before. And, um, you know, I think like 20 years ago, 25 years ago, um, cultural competency meant, you know, treating everyone the same, you know, everyone's the same, everyone is equal and, and treat him just the way you would treat her and, and all that good stuff. Right. And, and I think, you know, the message is, is good there. But now the real, the modern, the ultra modern, I'll use hobby terms, the ultra modern, uh, you know, ideology behind cultural competency is to is to respect and celebrate everyone for their individuality, you know, without discrimination. So I love, you know, don't look at everyone as the same. It's like, no, if, if that person is Dominican, then, you know recognize their heritage recognize that they are dominican and that they've had a different upbringing and they have yes. different values and if you are asian american you know you know recognize that and and help them celebrate that and ask questions and that's something that that i've been i i think something that i take a lot of pride in 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 my day job and in my personal life but really my day job and it's kind of bled over i think is that um i am always asking questions i'm always asking questions you know i'll ask um you know if i'm working with you know a client you know and and they are of a different race i'll ask them hey do you prefer this or do you prefer that do you prefer this or do you, you know it's like you know i've asked you know plenty of african americans or black people do you prefer black or do you prefer african american mm -hmm. you know and um, you know, just, I'm just using that as an example, but I'm, yeah. I'm just always asking questions, you know, especially with, um, LGBTQ, you know, right. um, with that ever evolving, um, 
you know, what's going on. You know, it's I'm always asking questions because I'm 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 always always learning. Um, I try to remain teachable, and I think by asking a lot of questions in my day job, that's I think transferred over into my content and in all reality if i collect cards and you collect cards like okay i'm sure we collect different things but that's really it so you know what makes our content our content i think when Mm -hmm. we can bring a piece of who we are as a person a piece of maybe what we do for work anything that can kind of separate us from one another in terms of content i think is huge remaining teachable i mean there's so many great things you said but that really hit me hard um in a in a great way um wow i love that thank you so much i mean you know with me um (laughs) we're gonna get to these questions we're gonna do group therapy session but you know being asian american um there is a saying uh in in asian cultures where it's like if you're the nail that sticks out the highest you're gonna get hammered down and when i grapple with my asian american identity you know, I do sometimes get uncomfortable with self promotion. And, you know, I feel like if I'm not, if I'm not my own biggest cheerleader, then who's going to do it for me, you know, but um, when I think about content creation, and when I think about, you know, just the the going from the old way, the, the vintage way of looking at color, which is being colorblind to the like, I like you, you using the word, uh, the term ultra modern, which is, I want people to see my color, because I, yeah. have, by virtue of my race, I had a different I may have had a different upbringing. So, you know, and then there's also, of course, like the socioeconomic uh, conditions and all that, uh, that all make us different. But yeah, I mean, I just, um, I really appreciate what you said. Uh, And one more thing I did want to say, which is when you have so much content out there, hours and hours of podcasts and videos and reels and content, like people want to like find something to find uh, oh, well, he said this one time and then he said things another time. But, you know, we we evolve. We're, again, remaining teachable. You can you and I can say something episode one. And I'm not saying that we would have been wrong. But later on, our, our thought processes could change. Like uh, because we we again remain teachable. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love this. OK. I'm, I'm going to skip past all the stuff uh, that I wanted to ask you to help me through it, like <laughs> sponsorships, burnout, family, hobby guilt, um, hobby quantity versus quality time. I'm skipping past all of this. Um, I'm going to go to the first question from the group uh, from Instagram, if that's OK. Yeah. All right. Zach Cersei, I'm going to start with an easy, fun one. <laughs> he asks, and I think he knew who you were. How many cards can you fit on a Harley? <laughs> How many cards on a Harley? I think the real question is how many slabs can you fit in cargo short pockets? <laughs> okay, because on the Harley, I likely would not put any, I would not bring any cards with me on the Harley unless they were in my cargo pockets because my cargo pockets are like a high tech safe. Only one person knows the combination. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That is awesome. I love it. Great answer to that. Um, I'm going to get a little bit deeper with this one. Uh, Watch the Breaks asks, why do I collect? So many different reasons. I, I, you know, I think we talked about it last time, you know, my, my collecting is nostalgia driven and, um, you know, oftentimes people collect to fill a void. So I would imagine there's probably some sort of void that is there with me and something that we touched on last time as well. I think probably that void for me is my father. So um, that, you know, then, you know, we, we collect, we, you know, we try to fill that void and we realize like, wow, this is really fun. This is really cool. I really enjoy collecting these cards. So then it kind of snowballs and branches off into something different. (sighs) Love that answer. All right. We, I know we t- touched on fatherhood last time and I, I don't want to start uh, tearing up here. So uh, <laughs> let's, let's, uh, I'll listen to cats in the cradle after this. Um, how about that? Okay. <laughs> Great song. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh my goodness. Um, 1980s cards with Dan asks, and it's kind of like the, why do I collect, but why do he asks, why do I keep buying new product boxes when I think we're in another junk wax era? Is this insanity? Well, It sounds like he's talking about two different products. Why do I keep on buying product makes me think that he's talking about packs or boxes of cards. And then he's saying junk slab. Did he say junk slab or junk wax? Junk wax. Oh, junk wax. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
I tell you, that's a big part of the reason why I don't collect ultra modern. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't collect ultra modern and, and even, even the modern started to get out of control. Like right here, I'm looking at just sitting right next to me. I have two 2008, uh, gold refractors. So they're mm -hmm. both Eli Manning gold refractors. Uh, one is autographed and then, uh, one, and that's a 10 and one is raw. So as incredible as these cards are, this is modern from 2008. So 15 years ago, there were still 199 of these gold refractors. So this is numbered out of 199. So even the modern stuff, in my opinion, has been, you know, kind of printed a lot. And, and I've never been a fan of manufactured rarity. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to collect something because I want to collect it, not because a card company is telling me I should. Now, if you start talking about, RPAs, if you start talking about the 2003 exquisite LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, that whole set, even all the way up into uh, a National Treasures, you know, RPA Luka, Luka Doncic uh, out of 99. But why does an RPA, if it's out of 99, why are you then making out of 49, out of 25, out of 15, mm -hmm. out of 10, mm -hmm. out of 3? Like that's when it starts getting that manufactured rarity. It's not that rare anymore. You're so good at this. All right. So the follow-up question to that, uh, Richard Price 1909 asks, why don't uh, – so so this question I was going to ask later on, but I'm bringing it up because we're talking about uh, Junk Wax era. If that is the case, Richard Price, 1909, asks, why don't more hobbyists buy into graded signed vintage? Oh, Richard, Richard, my friend. Um, I tell you, I've had, so that is something that I've been, I've been journeying down that lane for probably like the last 18 months now of just buying signed vintage. And um, I've had a lot of signed vintage collectors DMing me upset and saying that I'm actually affecting the market. And that and that I'm causing prices to rise because I'm talking about it. And I'm I've said to them, listen, man, I don't have that much power. I don't have that much reach. I'm not Gary V. You know what I mean? So like, <laughs> don't get mad. Don't get mad at me. I collect what I love. That's just what I do. I collect yeah. what I love, and and whatever it is I'm going through in the hobby, that's mm -hmm. what I'm talking about in the podcast. But you know, I have all signed vintage behind me. I'm just oh, going to grab man. the closest one Please. to me. You know, and that's a you know Mickey Mantle. 1958 oh, tops 58 all-star selection i mean this is an incredible incredible card i am so blessed and grateful to own this thing um and uh, i'll show off one more signed vintage please. this is this is one that like anytime i have it anywhere is it's usually the first one that people go to it's, it's kind of like a showstopper yeah. oh, it's yeah. the 1980 tops it's the magic johnson larry bird rookie with dr j it's a three mm -hmm. panel card mm -hmm. and this has got three signatures auto grade 10 so oh, yeah this thing is whew. so yeah um you know i gotta be honest i hope i, I hope that people more people don't get in the great advantage. If they do great, I'll fully support them. But I mean, yeah. you know, I'm not trying to see the supply dry up neither, you know, because it's stuff that I buy and I collect. Mm -hmm. So no, absolutely. So it's a good uh, segue into the next question, which is from M Garber, 1956, um, which is why do so many people get suckered into getting new cards slapped? Again, you were kind of showing slaps of vintage cards, but you know, I guess the question is kind of being like, you know, Oh my gosh, it, it's maybe an indictment on slab companies or grading companies. New cards. Why do people get new cards slabbed? Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, the the number on the slab yeah. is more than likely going to determine the value. Not more than likely, it's guaranteed to determine the value yeah. of the card. Yeah. With vintage, it's different because vintage collectors buy the card, not the grade. Yeah. So People will, I just bought this Willie Mays at the National. This card, I probably paid, it's a SGC2. I probably paid an SGC4 comp for it, mm -hmm. but it's because I bought the card and not the grade. So mm -hmm. it's the exact opposite with Ultra Modern. I don't know anyone that's like, no, well, you know what? I think I'm going to buy that. I think I'd prefer that PSA 8 over that PSA 10. You know, I mean, it just, it's all about the grade. So 
Gotcha. All right. So going for this nostalgia, nostalgia angle, and it's a great Instagram handle name, Game Day Nostalgia asks, how do I make sure to remain a collector who buys cards for the nostalgia? Well, if nostalgia is your thing, I'm pretty sure nostalgia will drive your collecting. Um, but I'm guilty of it, too. Uh, I Listen, nostalgia drives almost everything that I do, and every single purchase I make, it drives it. But I'd be lying if I said every once in a while a card will come across my feed, and I will immediately start searching to try to buy it. <laughs> You know, I mean, it's I'm I'm an impulse buyer, too, mm -hmm. you know, I, but I think it's about if you are an impulse buyer, it's about recognizing it. It's just like when someone has an issue with addiction or if someone mm -hmm. has, you know, some mental health stuff going on. The first step is actually recognizing and admitting there's an issue. So if you're an impulse buyer and you and you are frequently looking back, I impulse bought a card. Oh, I can't find it. I'm such ah. Oh. I had it next to me just so I could show it off. Hold on. Paint, Talk paint for a sec. Picture. I'm going to find okay. this card. Well, I was going to ask you to paint us a word picture, but you, you have gotten up from your chair. You are looking through your expansive, extensive collection in the back. Um, I can't even imagine. So a lot of what Rob does collect, he also um, sells at shows. Okay, go ahead. I, I so I bought this card Ooh. two weeks ago on eBay. This thing will never leave my side. I am never going to try to put it in a trade, even if someone offers me triple what I paid for it. It's a 2021 Topps Chrome Dominic Barlow Overtime Elite Purple. Yeah. It's numbered out of 299. It's a PSA 10. I got it for like $8. Okay. Yeah. The second I won this card, I go, why the heck did I even bid on that? And I'll tell you why. Because. I saw three cards I liked from this consigner and I'm like, I'm winning these cards. And you know what? The rest of these cards are going for dollars. Mm. So let me just start bidding on everything. You want to know what ended up happening? The three cards I actually wanted that I was certain I would get, I got overbid on. I didn't actually win any of that. The only thing I won was this freaking card. So I'm leaving this next to me right here i'm leaving it next to me and it's never leaving my side because it's a constant reminder to oh not God. just buy something just to buy it on ebay that's a great reason to have that card um i know we only have a couple of minutes and i want to knock these three questions out if that's okay yep. um speaking about buying ultra modern m of mystery breaks asks why does panini keep causing us pain and torment <laughs> Um, I think greed, I think greed was probably a big part of it. And hopefully yeah. fanatics is going to, um, relieve some of that burden from them. I, I remain cautiously optimistic with, uh, them trying to do the long game, right? Short term yep. quarterly earnings. I mean, I understand people when you're corporate, you want to do that, but I, I remain cautiously optimistic that yep. they'll see the long, long game in this. Okay. Inspired Sports Cards asks, oh, no, uh, let me end on that one. Sarah Rips asks, why did the Nuggets, she wrote this in all caps, Sarah Rips of uh, Nikki Rips and Sarah Rips, shout out to them. Uh, why did the why did the Nuggets win the finals, but all players besides Jokic went down? All caps. Couldn't tell you, but i tell you what, I did watch this clip today of Jokic. I watched like this reel on Instagram and it was just a compilation of like all his game day quotes and, you know, oh, interview gosh. segments. And yeah. he basically admits that he does not enjoy playing basketball. He strictly looks at it as a job. Um, they asked him if he gives any kind of speeches in the locker room to try to yeah. rally the, um, his team and lead his team. And he just looked at him and said, no, it's like the guy doesn't even want to be there. So. What, what I'll tell you what, you, yeah. I, is it, I don't know. I, I feel like he would probably be, uh, I'm just glad I'm not collecting Jokic, even though he's <laughs> an incredible talent, incredible talent. Shout out to uh, Chris Hoge with that one. Um, with two quotes. Uh, one is, uh, you work to live, not live to work. And then the second one that comes to mind is, uh, once you find what you love to do in life and you work at the, with that, you never work a day in your life. So I mm -hmm. guess uh, Jokic is going to just keep working until he has enough money for his horses and 
he can just ride off into the sunset. So, yeah, um, this is the final question. And I really appreciate your time. Um, yeah. Just I hope people really enjoyed this episode as much as I had, you know, um, I guess I'll call it, call it a interview or therapy session with you. Last question is from Inspired Sports Cards asks, what does it mean if I'm checking the centering corners, edges and surface on all of our family photos now? <laughs> oh, that's amazing. That is that is the perfect question to end on. That means you're a, a hobby enthusiast. I love it. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I agree with that. Um, I know last time you and I talked, you said you should have an outro. I don't really have a good one. I kind of like this whole like uh, international listener saying goodbye to them. So maybe that's my outro. Cool. But um, I, I did write it down because there's no way I know any Estonian or I don't even know if that's what it's called. But to my Estonian listeners, can you please say goodbye in Estonian, which is huvasti? Hufasti. Oh, you almost said it like in a really good way. Uh, Rob, thank you so much. Um, you are just, again, just uh, so great for the hobby. Really appreciate you and your mentorship. Um, your friendship means a lot to me. Uh, it's really helped me grow in the hobby too. So I uh, hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. And thank you everyone for tuning in. <laughs> All right. Dude, great job.